Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Our topic for tonight is Interpreting the FIT Test Report and Understanding KBMO's New Zonulin, Zonulin S Assay. My name is Christopher Chu. I am the Director of Marketing for Avexia Diagnostics and will be your host for this evening. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by an outstanding guest, Dr. Brent Dorval, who will be our presenter for this webinar. Dr. Dorval has over 35 years of experience in strategic management of research, manufacturing, and regulatory affairs in the area of medical devices and diagnostics. Most recently, Dr. Dorval founded Brendan Bioscience to capitalize on patents covering new immunoassay methods for analyte detection. Dr. Dorval holds a PhD in medical microbiology and immunology from the College of Medicine, the Ohio State University, and performed postdoctoral studies and was a visiting scholar in the Department of Chemistry at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In addition, Dr. Dorval was an advisor to the World Health Organization Committee on Vaccines and Diagnostics in Geneva. Joining Dr. Dorval tonight will be Dr. Wayne Sedano, our Director of Clinical Support and Education at Avexia Diagnostics. Additionally, Dr. Sedano is the Director of Integrative Medicine Education for the College of Integrative Medicine and lectures and teaches internationally. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. We encourage participation. So if you have a question, you may submit your question in the questions field in the right area of the interface. We will answer submitted questions towards the end of the presentation. If your question is not answered this evening, you will surely receive an answer by email within a day or two. Without further delay, I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Dorval. Yeah, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be invited as a speaker to Avixia tonight. Uh, much appreciated. Um, tonight, we're going to talk a, a bit about how do you interpret the FIT test report, so the food sensitivity report, and how you get understanding uh, of, from the new KBMO uh, zonulin assay and how that fits in with food sensitivities. So in the next slide, what we'll first go over is just some general concepts. So what we'd like to do is just understand the results of a FIT test report. They're pretty straightforward, but there are some guidelines. We want to identify foods that may cause a food sensitivity. So those would be positive foods identify foods that actually cause a food sensitivity, and those occur after you do an elimination diet. And this will enable you to design a restriction diet that will then be uh, focused on you know, patient uh, intervention, patient health, and then understand zonulin testing and the role of zonulin in that particular test in gut permeability. So at first, let's just discuss a few simple concepts in the next slide. So we need some client information kind of ready at hand. We need the diet, that's obvious. So foods currently consumed. We need to know the medical history, um, especially you know if there are any underlying organic illnesses, arthritis, diabetes, irritable bowel, allergy, especially type one allergy, IgE mediated. Certain medications, anti-inflammatories and antibiotics, which certainly modify the immune response, and then supplements, which have become very, very important over the past 10 years. People take a lot of supplements, uh, in, whether they're vitamins or uh, in smoothies or power bars, uh, these various types of health foods, etc., all have ingredients in them that can play a role uh, in food sensitivity. And the next slide. So just a few uh, simple concepts. So food sensitivity and related diseases affect at least 100 million people worldwide, and that's very conservative. And but what one thing's for sure is the prevalence has increased more than 50% in both adults and children in just the past few years alone. So some people speculate on why that occurs, but um, my feeling is a lot has to do 
with food processing, you know, so how foods are processed and the additives that are used uh, uh, in various cases. The symptoms can be uh, wide. So you have rashes, the headache, the chronic intestinal diseases, and, and things in between. So symptoms are generated from inflammation, and inflammation plays a role in a wide variety of diseases. 90% uh, of the sensitivities occur in so-called the big eight, the big eight food groups, you know, milk, soy, eggs, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. So uh, not surprisingly, those are the foods that are most uh, um, consumed the most and the most frequently. Um, and then a good concept is one or all foods in a specific group may cause a food sensitivity. We'll go over that a little bit, whether uh, a foods have cross-reactivity, uh, or not. So we'll touch on that. Uh, and what's important is delayed food sensitivities, um, they occur hours or days after the ingestion or exposure to a particular food or additive. So unlike a type 1 allergy, which is immediate, you get exposed and within a few minutes you'll have some sort of reaction. These will take uh, up to uh, two, three days uh, to manifest in certain cases. And that's why it, it, uh, a good food sensitivity test is useful because you can't remember what you ate on Monday and now you're feeling unwell, say on Wednesday. So uh, if you have a test that can pick out the positive foods that will help you design an elimination diet. Now, delayed food sensitivities are caused by IgG one through four and immune complexes that activate complement. We'll talk about that. So immune complexes activate the complement cascade. They activate C3, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We measure C3D as a marker that tells you C3B has been activated. And if C3B is activated, it generates the anaphylatoxin C3A, which causes the inflammation. Uh, in the next slide. So a few just definitions, of course, food allergy, that's a type one IgE mediated immediate reaction. Um, very often people, uh, much like my wife, you need an EpiPen if you're exposed to certain things like latex or, or, or other types of, of shell food, shellfish or other types of antigens, nuts. Um, these can be pretty severe in certain individuals. We'll be talking about food sensitivity. And again, it's an immunologic reaction. So that's part of the acquired immune system. And it's a type two, type three. And it's generated by IgA or IgG mediated delayed type hypersensitivity. And we're gonna focus on IgG mediated DTH tonight. And then the third category, of course, everybody knows is food intolerance. And that's non-immunologic. And the typical one there is enzyme deficiency and it's lactase. Somebody consumes milk or milk product uh, and they get quite ill. And the reason is they don't have an enzyme that will digest the sugar lactose. So they're uh, lactose intolerant. Uh, in the next slide. So again, innate versus acquired immunity is a very important concept. So initially, the immune system has three levels of defense against disease-causing organisms, chemicals, or foreign proteins. And I would put foods in that category, especially when they get through the gut wall. So the first line, obviously, is barrier, right? Skin, mucous membranes, stomach acid, enzymes, and gut bacteria. So that's the first line of defense to try to keep these things out of the body, and then they can be excreted normally. Now, the innate immunity are, uh, is composed of a variety of cells, WBC, so that's white blood cells, which are the neutrophils, macrophages, they phagocyte, phagocytize bacteria, viruses, and foreign proteins. And then complement, as I just mentioned, what happens is if a foreign um, uh, protein, bacteria, or immune complex is formed, what happens is C3 is activated, C3B is an opsonin. So that enables macrophages to engulf or phagocytize these complexes or bacteria viruses uh, very, very efficiently. So that's the innate immunity and it's innate because it's always there. It doesn't have to be generated in response to an antigen. It's waiting for an antigen to come in and then immediately it can react. Now, 
contrast that with the acquired immunity. That also has white blood cell components, particularly the T cells, the cytotoxic helper and antigen presenting cells, especially dendritic cells. Um, they destroy cancer cells or infected cells. But what happens is these components have to activate the immune system. So first you generate IgM, then you generate IgG, and then IgG binds to the antigen. After it's produced by a B cell, it binds to the antigen, and then it's cleared from the body. So that's a very, very important concept. So that takes time. So from exposure to an antigen through to produce IgG, it could take maybe up to 10 or even 12 or 14 days. So that's a very important concept. So in the next slide. So this is the FIT test. This is the um, technology uh, that I patented about 20 years ago um, after looking at a variety of tests that were in the market. So what we wanted to do was, um, my background is it comes out of uh, complement biochemistry and, and looking at immune complexes and, and kind of kidney disease. So we wanted to take advantage of the formation of immune complex and see if we could enhance sensitivity and specificity. So on the right hand, I mean on the left hand side, I'm sorry, of the uh, of the uh, diagram, what you see is a conventional conjugate that only measures IgG one through four. So the antigen that um, is uh, bound to the ELISA plate is then contacted with a sample that binds from the serum. And then you add the anti-IgG HRP, and then that's the detection reagent. So think about that as you generate one signal. You generate one signal for the IgG only. Now contrast that with the right-hand side. We what we devised and patented was an enhanced conjugate. So we took advantage of the fact that the antibody binds to the plate and that's the IgG one through four and we can detect it anti-human IgG one through four HRP. So we get one signal. But notice what happens is when you form an immune complex, complement is activated. And what happens is, is it deposits covalently onto the antibody. So it was like, hmm, maybe we can detect one more signal if we could measure that C3D component or the inflammatory component, which indicates complement's been activated. So uh, I set about doing that. So what, and, and it's easy to say, and it took two years to, to figure it out. Um, but what we found is we can generate one signal for the anti-C3D HRP, and we generate one signal for the anti-human uh, IgG. So now we generate two signals for every one signal that you get from a conventional conjugate. So you say, okay, why, why is that important? Well, that enhances the sensitivity at least twofold, and it also improves the specificity. So instead of getting, instead of trying to increase the signal by adding more of the anti-human IgG, and what happens is you get background and you get false positives. So by adding the anti-human C3D, we got enhanced signal, double the signal, but what we didn't get was high background and false positives. So that was that was very, uh, very important. And I, I'm just smiling because it, it's a simple concept, but it took an awful long time to, to try to sort that out. So that so think about it. Conventional assay gets one signal. Our assay, the fit test, two signals, enhanced sensitivity without the problems with specificity, meaning false positives. So in the next slide. So when would a practitioner use the FIT test? Uh, you know, so if a client doesn't feel well, you know, they'll come in, they'll have general malaise. I just don't feel well. Or if they have specific uh, diseases or symptoms, so autoimmune, thyroid, arthritis, brain fog, fatigue, digestive and gut issues especially, and skin issues, we see an awful lot of that. Fibroids, endometriosis, and breast cancer. So these, all these diseases have one thing in common. It's inflammation. And the ability of the FIT test to measure inflammation using the C3D 
flag, the C3D component on the antibody is very, very important because inflammation is really the cornerstone of, of all diseases. I mean, it's in, in one way, shape, or manner. So in the next slide. So there, I won't go over this, obviously, but this shows you the food we test. We, we do three basic panels, a FIT-22, a FIT-132, and a FIT-176 for 176 foods. And they pretty much cover all the big ones, the dairy, the grains, the vegetables, beans, additives, et cetera. So you can go over this uh, at your leisure, but we uh, have a good offering of foods and food additives. Um, and we break it down. So um, if you want to just stick your toe in the water and just do a trial test and, and see how it works, you could do a FIT-22. I, I generally re recommend a FIT-132. That's a good standard panel. It really covers a lot of ground. 132 foods and additives, and then FIT-176 is the uh, highest end panel, and that has a few uh, offerings, uh, obviously, that the FIT-136 doesn't have. Uh, in the next slide. So, in general, you, we, we um, use the FIT test to generate a report, and the report tells you whether a food tests positive or negative with 95% confidence. So that's what we do. This is statistical parameter and 95% confidence limit. So in this, what, what you wanna do is when you get a report, what you want to do is first off, try to group things by family and intensity. In other words, is it plant or animal or microbial? And the family, of each food tested is in the practitioner's guide. So we're gonna have a new practitioner's guide in a couple of weeks, but the old guide is, is sufficient and it groups things, especially in a table and, and back. So it helps you interpret the test quickly. So if you look at the top panel here, what it shows you is green, aqua, yellow, and red reactivity. So green is negative, uh, the uh, light green or aqua is one plus, yellow uh, two plus, and red is four plus. So the higher the reactivity, the higher the tighter the antibody, and the more likely that particular food or ingredient is to cause a food sensitivity. So what we recommend is that look at the two, three, and four plus initially when a patient comes in and tests positive, because the likelihood of a sensitivity being in the higher end of reactivity is most likely. And so if we look at this panel and just say, how do we group it? If you look at cow's milk and goat's milk, those both gave a four plus, so very high reactivity. Cow's milk and goat's milk, while they're obviously from different species, they have 70, 80% homology in the proteins that are in the milk. So it's not unexpected that if someone sometimes tests positive to, to, to cow milk, even though they may not consume goat milk, they may test positive to goat milk or vice versa. And it's sometimes you'll test positive for cow's milk, but notice how casein is negative um, in this particular test. And that's because casein is an acid or enzyme precipitate of milk. So it's been denatured. So what this tells you is it, it reacts with native proteins in cow's milk and goat's milk in this case, but it does not seem to react to um, the denatured proteins that are uh, comprised casein. So just there's a, a lot of, it's a simple report, but there are a few nuances and the guide will help you through that. Now then if we look to the right a little bit, you look at wheat and then one's wheat and one other one is wheat gluten right beside it, and then rye. So those are three foods, grains that are in the poesi. So we're in their same family of grains, same family, um, and the proteins are very similar in the same family, meaning the poesi. So it's not unusual, again, if this person consumed wheat and was highly sensitive to it, that they may also cross-react with a protein that is in rye and that's why you would pick it up. So when your patient says, well, I consume wheat, but I don't, I don't, I never have rye, never have, I can't ever remember, then most likely the explanation for that is it's a cross-reactivity. 
So again, a nuance. And then you look at the aqua ones like peach and BHA. Now they're one plus. And while we say don't focus on them initially, you just kind of keep them in the back of your mind, say they're positive. Okay, we're gonna deal with the high reactives first. And then if we have to, we can come back um, to those and, uh, and see if they play any role. Uh, in the next slide, this just shows you another panel uh, that's in uh, from the FIT 132 or 176. And again, it's the same sort of concept where, and what I wanted to highlight here was this particular individual on the right hand most side, crab, lobster, and shrimp. They are very closely related in proteins. So the person could say, well, yeah, I consume shrimp, but I don't consume lobster or crab. So that would be a cross reactivity. If they say, well, yeah, I, I eat these all, all of them off and on, then most likely the explanation is these are consumed on a fairly regular basis. And what we're picking up is a true reactivity against that particular food. And notice what I'm trying to highlight too is that very often in individuals, you get clustering. So in that seafood, you get crab, lobster, and shrimp. So if an individual is sensitive to one in that group, it's not unheard of for them to have two or three in the same group that would also be positive. And that would be the same thing for this individual in fowl or, or uh, for chicken, uh, duck, and turkey. Again, very closely related uh, birds. Um, and very often you get one or more, um, so you get that clustering effect. And then this one has an isolated uh, reaction to peanut and then um, also to, to catfish. So again, you go through the diet, you try to understand what they're eating, and then from there you move into supplements and you say, okay, if they're not consuming a, per, a certain food, is it in perhaps in a supplement that they're taking? Because people are taking lots and lots of supplements these days. They're highly concentrated. They take them frequently, and that sets you up for a potential uh, a positive reaction and food sensitivity. So uh, um, from the diet, you go to supplements, and then you can also back into um, the patient history just to understand what type of organic um, illness this patient may have and see if that has any role in what we're looking at. And especially patients that have type one IgE mediated allergies, the true allergies. Because what happens very often is you'll produce an IgE antibody against like pollen or against an enzyme. They call them chitinases in pollen or uh, from, from birch or from oak or another plant. But what happens is you also produce an IgG antibody against pollen. And what you'll see on this test is those IgG antibodies then cross react with fruits, nuts, and vegetables. So again, it's a nuance where from knowing the medical history, you'll say he's got a type one allergy. Now I'm seeing reactivity to a particular food that this person doesn't consume. So most likely, it's a cross-reactive antibody that's generated by the IgE allergy. And that's very common. And it was traditionally thought that you either produced IgE or IgG, there was no both antibodies at one time. Well, we know today that, that that's not true. So again, just the nuance. Um, and again, some of this will be pointed out in the new providers guide. Uh, in the next slide, Uh, so understanding the report. So what I do, I deal with a lot of providers and, and a few patients, mostly providers um, uh, on my end of things. So what I encourage people to do is once they've got a report, take and list the foods on the left-hand side that are positive and then put them in a family or a group and then look at the relative reactivity. And that will help you understand and explain things to a patient. Now, this will almost become second nature. The goal is to be able to take a report within five or 10 minutes, you know exactly what you're gonna to present to the patient and, and you're ready to move on. But initially it's helpful if you just generate a little table and then list things like this 
And then it gives you a handle on the number of foods, the intensity, what families they're in, and, and it gives you a, a, just a broad overview. And you could also provide this to the patient uh, uh, if you want. Now, it's especially important to do this sort of thing. Let's say if a patient had a test um, last January and uh, you know we, we had a certain table like this. The question is now you test them a year later what are they sensitive or what are they potentially sensitive to today? So if you construct a table like this that has last year's results and then the current results, it gives you a good comparison of where they were and where they are now. And what you'll see universally, I mean virtually across the board, is that a person will take an initial test, they'll test very high, positives to certain foods, and they'll also have a lot of symptoms. 10 months, 12 months later, you retest them. What happens is what you'll see, the foods in those categories have gone from a four to a two, a three to a one, or a two to a negative. So what you see over time is antibodies have a half-life of about three to four weeks. So antibodies go away as long as you go through the elimination diet and remove the food. So out there 10, 12 months, the antibodies are much lower. But then when you ask the patients via a form, we use a form and just say, okay, what are your symptoms today versus what were they initially? And, and uniformly, what you find is antibody titers have gone down and in general, the symptoms are starting to resolve. And that could mean something like a migraine. A migraine patient comes in, I have a migraine two or three times a week, and it's, and it's debilitating. It's severe. I, in fact, I have to take some sort of analgesic for that. They take the test. They remove the foods. They report upon second uh, test for the symptoms. They come in. They say, yeah, I still get a headache, but now it's maybe once, once every week, once every couple of weeks, and it's not nearly as severe as it used to be. So you don't cure patients per se. But what you do is if you can put your finger on the right food, get it out of the diet, the patient feels better. And that's the goal. And the reason is you've, re you've identified a food that causes inflammation. And when you reduce the inflammation, the patient feels better. And, and I think that's the goal. And then the next slide. So just understanding the report, one of the difficult things is the, the third step is just determine the cross-reactivity. And again, it's not difficult when you think your way through it, but it's a little bit uh, a difficult concept initially. So when we look at additive spices, foods, and medications that contain something in common, like a fennel ring, a fennel ring is something that gives um, a spice its flavor. It gives its additive and additive its functional properties. It gives it a medication its, its effect. So what they do is these phenyl groups are very important. And what we know about those is they bind tightly to proteins and they form what's called a haptin. And the haptin is what you generate an antibody against. So the big protein carries it and the haptin generates the antibody by the B cell. So so if you look at peppers, capsaicin contains the fennel. Medications that people take, lisinopril, cannabinoids, metoprolol, atorvastin, and amidodarone, all those contain fennel groups. So when you're looking at a report, and it goes over this quite a bit in the guide, that has, uh, and the person is sensitive to compounds that have a fennel group, no, don't only think of you know, BHA or BHT that are on the report or, or some of the spices, cinnamon or nutmeg or some of the others. Think of looking at the medic medications this person might be on and say, are they taking any medications that have a fennel ring as its primary constituent? So the, the, the reason you do that is that the question is, does the reactivity to the fennel group on the FIT test, is that the reactivity against RED40, or is it a cross-reactivity because a person produced um, an antibody against something like um, lisinopril? 
So by knowing the medications and knowing what's in the report, you can kind of get some idea at least of that of that phenyl compound. And, and I and I there's others, but I, I I try to emphasize phenyl because that is a key constituent in in most um, foods and spices and that sort of thing, and also in medications. Now. And antibodies in plants and pro antibodies against proteins from plants in the same family occurs because proteins are very similar in structure within the same family. So let's just take the rose family. So the rosaceae, and I don't you don't expect anybody to become a botanist. This is all in the guide. That's the beautiful thing. So you say, okay, rosaceae, that's a family. Things in that family are similar. Okay, so apple, apricot, cherry, peach, pear, raspberry, strawberry, et cetera, they're all in that same family. So if your patient is sensitive to apple, cherry, peach, and pear, then most likely they're um, reactive to a broad antigen within that group, as opposed to if they're only sensitive to apple, it's probably a protein that's unique to apple. So you can kind of get a sense of, is it a broad reactivity or is it a narrow reactivity? And if it's a broad reactivity, the implications are for the elimination diet is then you're gonna to want to remove members of the rose family from the diet during the elimination phase, several or many of them, especially if we don't test them and they eat them. So you wanna remove those as opposed if it's only one, then you only have to remove the apple. So the implication is broad, you're gonna to have to remove many members of the family, narrow is chances are just one. Now, there are hidden cross-reactivities uh, of antibodies against proteins from dissimilar foods. And the poster child for that is weak gliadin. I'm sure you hear about that frequently. And the peptide in that cross-reacts with yeast, casein, so caseomorphin, uh, also coffee peptides, and also milk. So um, what you can get is you can get a sensitivity to wheat, but you can get cross reactivities with wheat, casein, coffee, and milk. So knowing the diet, knowing the supplements, you can figure out, does that person consume that particular food or is it, and is it simply a cross reactivity or do they consume all of those foods, the wheat, the yeast, the casein, coffee, and milk, do they consume them all? So you'll know that from the diet. And then uh, lastly, um, almost lastly, allergy, uh, IgG is produced which cross reacts with fruits, vegetables, and nuts. So I mentioned that. So in IgE allergy, you also spin off IgG, which then can cross react on the fit test and produce uh, positives um, because they're cross reacting with the pollen antigen. Um, and then lastly, uh, pollen, as I mentioned, and certain enzymes are the real culprits uh, in IgE allergy, and you have sensitivities to those that then can cause cross-reactivities. So in the next slide. Uh, okay, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, additives. So if you look at page 24, 34, and 35 on in the guide and spices and, and foods containing a fennel ring, um, what you can see is that cinnamon, benzoic acid, curcumin, vanilla, capsaicin, and ginger. What you can see is that six-membered ring. So some are substituted, some are unsubstituted, more like the benzoic acid and cinnamon. There's only one substitution there. Whereas if you look at curcumin, there's three substitutions on that. But you can still get significant cross-reactivity. Now remember that a lot of drugs have similar structures to these additives and spices. So that's why you may get cross-reactivity. And the next slide. So, right, so understanding the report. So this, this comes down, the nuts and bolts really come down to how do I design a restriction diet? So what we say is each food or additive that scores a two to four plus is removed from the diet for six to eight weeks. And the reason we say that is because the antibody half-life for IgG is about three to four weeks. So if you are positive um, today, in three weeks, you'd have half as much antibody in your system. Now that's a general rule um, and there are some nuances there, but three to four weeks is a good guideline. 
Then what you do is you add back each food additive one at a time and track the symptoms for up to three days post-consumption because these are delayed reactivities. So sometimes you'll eat it on Monday and by Tuesday you'll feel something or sometimes it may not be till Wednesday or maybe even Thursday. So I would recommend just ask the patient uh, just to keep a little diary to say, here's when I introduced it and kind of keep track of how they feel. Then if symptoms appear, then you remove the food or additive from the diet for up to 10 months. And the practitioner's guide, uh, again, in the table in the back gives you some good replacement foods. And during that 10 months, 10 months isn't magic, but what happens is three things really. Antibody is, is removed. So IgG antibody has been cleared from the system. Number two, the B cells that produce the antibody, if they haven't been exposed to the food, they'll become kind of quiescent. So they won't be in an active proliferative stage. They'll be still be in the lymph node. They'll still be able to recognize that antigen, but they've become quiet. And the third thing is, if leaky gut is a feature of what this person is experiencing, meaning the antigens are getting from the lumen of the gut across the gut wall into the lamina propria to generate that antibody, the gut will heal over time. So during 10 months, the antibody goes away, the B cells become quiet, and the gut starts to heal. And so what happens is then if you reduce, uh, if you reduce, if you, re if you reintroduce that food back into the diet after 10 months, many times the patient will say, geez, I ate it on Monday after 10 months, but she said, doesn't, doesn't affect me anymore. And what I would recommend in that case is, okay, they've seemed to shake that allergy or uh, sensitivity, but tell them to rotate it in the diet. Now you'll have other patients after 10 months, they'll eat it on Monday. And by Tuesday, they'll be just as sick as they were uh, 10 months ago. And those individuals, they simply have to remove that food if not indefinitely for a much longer period of time and substitute it for something else. Um, and if the food is not, uh, as I mentioned, what's important is if the food or additive is not a, pro, uh, a problem, then just rotate it in the diet because if they start to eat it frequently again, what happens is the food sensitivity uh, will return because those B cells are there and they're just waiting to see that antigen. And when they do, they're going to really start to turn over, the, turn over and proliferate and start to produce antibody uh, at a high level again. Uh, in the next slide. So just understanding the report uh, in general or for a summary. So the FIT test is a valuable tool to identify food sensitivities when used in conjunction with knowledge of diet, medical history, supplements, and medication. Food sensitivities can be broad or they can be spe specific or involve a, a cross reactivity. And again, a lot of that's going over in the guide. A restriction diet based on the FIT test result can be designed to pinpoint foods that cause food sensitivity. So the elimination diet is really the gold standard. The FIT test tells you you're positive for an antibody and that may be responsible for symptoms, but when you remove it from the diet and then reintroduce it, when you reintroduce it, if that food then causes a problem, then you've identified that food that um, uh, will induce certain symptoms. What the FIT test does for you is it narrows it down and tells you what are the most likely candidates that will cause uh, a food sensitivity so as to make an elimination diet much easier to construct. So zonulin, uh, it's a protein that's synthesized in intestinal uh, cells and also liver cells. So it's a, it's a small protein, it's about 46 uh, kilodaltons. What's important is it's a key marker uh, for intestinal permeability, uh, discovered by Alessio uh, Fasano. And it's a reversible regulator of in, intestinal permeability. That means once it's produced, it can cause uh, permeability and a leaky gut. But once you remove it, as I mentioned, the gut will heal. And not surprisingly, ele elevated levels of zonulin are associated with a variety of diseases, autoimmune, celiac, IBD, obesity, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. So 
the cornerstone of a lot of these uh, um, types of uh, diseases is that you have problems with tight junctions. And we'll discuss that a little bit. So zonulin opens tight junctions, and that is the foundation on which most of these diseases are built on. In the next slide. So this is just the schematic from, uh, from Alessio Fasano, uh, uh, who's at Harvard Medical School, uh, who, uh, who we've worked with. Um, and what this shows is the gut epithelium. And what you're looking at are the podocytes um, starting from the leftmost moving right. And so what happens is gluten or gliadin is the poster child for the release of zonulin. So I'm using that. But please remember that bacteria, viruses, other types of inflammatory molecules such as TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, et cetera, can all cause release of zonulin or opening of tight junctions or both. So we're just using this to kind of delineate the pathway, but there are a lot of other causes. So it's a general phenomenon and it's not exclusive to just gliadin from gluten. So on the uh, leftmost slide, um, what happens is the gliadin peptide binds to the first receptor, which is um, DPPIV. So that's a dipeptidyl peptidase. So it binds there and it's broken down into fragments that bind to the chemokine receptor, the CXCR3. So I don't expect you to memorize all this stuff, but this is a nice simple, simple schematic. So that chemokine receptor goes through a MyD88 pathway. So that's a lymphocyte differentiation pathway, and it tells the cell to produce zonulin. So that's all you have to remember. Gliadin binds to a receptor, induces the cell, to produce zonulin. Zonulin is then re released from the cell into the lumen of the gut. And then what it does is next, uh, next is, is just very uh, interesting. It hijacks the epidermal growth factor receptor. So it's released into the lumen and it binds to that receptor because protein structurally, it looks a lot and structurally is a lot like epidermal growth factor. And so what it does is it activates the pathway that ultimately pulls apart the tight junction in the cell, which is the occludin and cloudin. So that's right in, the, in, in between the two sets of cells right in the middle where the, where the red, green, and yellow diamonds are going through. So the occludin and cloudin are like two proteins that plug that pore, but then zonulin stimulates that the actually it's myosin that's linked to those proteins and it pulls them apart just like a rubber band and it opens up that uh, pore so now the lumen of the gut is exposed to the or uh, the lamina propria is exposed to the lumen of the gut so the lamina propria is the bottommost layer of cells so the, the T cells, the B cells, those star-shaped cells are dendritic cells. Those uh, process antigens and tell the immune system to produce an antibody or to engulf the antigen by phagocytosis, et cetera. So again, remember that zonulin then triggers through a receptor the dismantling of occludin and cloudin. You open up a pore, and now what happens is antigens from inside the lumen of the gut, food antigens, other antigens too, get through, get into the lamina propria, activate T and B cells, and then you start to produce anti-food antibodies. And also, it's very important, anti-zonulin antibodies. So you start to generate antibodies against your own protein. So almost like a tumor marker that's autoimmune you produce it against zonulin. And, and why that's important uh, will be explained in the next slide. So it, it, it's, it, it's way more complicated than this, but this is distilled by Alessio in, in, I thought, in a very nice way that's complex enough to kind of get the flavor, 
but not too complex that you're really in the in in a, in a very very complex pathways that are actually involved. So just remember, zonulin opens the tight junction, and the lamina propria with the immune cells are now exposed to antigens, food antigens that are in the gut lumen. So in the next slide. So so we started looking at a zonulin assay three years ago, and I started working on this with a group um, uh, at KBMO. And what we knew were there were a number of problems. And the first one was cross-reactivity. Haptoglobin, properdin, complement fragments, especially C3, block zonulin binding, and you just, you get a lot of uh, false negatives. So you get a low number of positives. So that's a big, big problem. And it's well known that uh, that cross-reactivity is a huge problem. There is no ELISA out there. And I'll repeat, no ELISA out there on the market today sold by any company in the world that measures zonulin specifically, zonulin protein, none, zero. And that's right from Alessio Fasano uh, uh, himself. And he's the discoverer of zonulin. And he's the one that elucidated um, the issues with many of these assays. One of the biggest problems though is uh, sample timing. Concentration of zonulin in serum varies widely during the day, which results in difficulty even getting an accurate measurement. In fact, in one paper, the level of zonulin can go from positive to, to negative in as little as four minutes. So that presents a, a challenge for a phlebotomist to get the right moment when uh, you can actually measure the molecule. So sample timing is a huge issue. And traditionally, the sample type has been serum or they use fecal uh, um, uh, sample as well. In the next slide, this is how we got around it. So zonulin IgG antibody measure, measurement resolves problem, problems with the zonulin protein ELISA. And so number one, it eliminates cross-reactivity. So we actually cloned the human zonulin protein in such a way that it has no cross-reactivity. So it eliminates cross-reactivity with haptoglobin, properdin, and the complement fragments. It was a huge challenge, um, and many no one else has done it. We've got it's a unique protein, and I don't think anybody was crazy enough to even try it. But we did, and we managed to, to solve it, not without a lot of difficulty. So we eliminated the cross reactivity. That was very good. So that what happened was the positivity rate went up because it eliminates zonulin blocking. So that and and when you look at papers that are published out there depending on the disease, depending on the patient population, you're probably in the 15, 20, 25% positivity rate for patients. And uh, we are right in that zone. So we knew that we were getting what we should get in terms of the positivity rate for a particular pop population. And just as important was sample timing. What we also know is serum IgG concentration is stable for days and days at a time, which assures that you can get an accurate measurement. So you don't have to worry about timing uh, a sample. So you get a good, accurate sample. And what we use is we use serum, we use blood spot, and we don't use fecal. Now, a lot of people like blood spots uh, these days because you can do a finger stick. It's simple, it's quick, it's cheap, it's easy to ship. Um, and what we've done is, is something um, that's very hard to do. It's, we've learned over time how to extract antibodies and immune complexes off these cards completely, get them into solution so that then you can test them in ELISA. And a lot of people will tell you blood spots are no good and this and that, and they'll give you 10 reasons to Sunday why you shouldn't use them. Well, if you read the literature, what you, what you find is if you carefully control how you extract and dilute these particular blood spots that the results are equivalent to what you get in serum or plasma. So that's good. And plus we've developed and we are going to patent, we're in the process right now, uh, a method, a specialized method uh, that uh, standardizes blood spots um, that, is, that is very, uh, very novel and enables us to use blood spots on the FIT test as well as uh, for zonulin as well. 
So in the next slide. So the next generation is on you. And so uh, what we did was release this March 1st. So that's available now. So it comes automatically on the 132 and the 176 food test. Um, I think it's a small, a small amount more. Uh, and zonulin measures IgG antibody and more stable specific markers I mentioned than zonulin protein. And we get a similar positivity rate. Again, you gotta look at what population you're looking at to say, okay, what should the rate be approximately? And when we hit that particular zone, we knew uh, that we were, uh, we were right over the target. Well, the test format is, again, it's an ELISA assay. It's used as serum or blood spot. And um, uh, Dr. Fasano uh, has also used these sample types uh, in his research. Um, the DREAM team uh, is, is uh, I'll, it, it should be uh, Dr. Fasano. He can leave me out. But uh, he discovered Zonulin and partnered with us. So uh, very, uh, very nice guy. And um, uh, I was the developer of the first rapid HIV diagnostic back in 19. 95 when HIV was uh, raging and uh, um, we cloned the first protein uh, that was a universal protein for HIV type 1 and now pretty much everybody uses that protein uh, in HIV diagnostics uh, to this day I've, I have two patents on that and uh, they make about a million tests a month uh, based on that particular platform. So as I mentioned, the FIT-132 and 176 now includes zonulin screening. So I just want to um, just take just a moment. So it becomes an issue is what is the relationship between food sensitivity and zonulin and then symptoms and patient history? So that's what this slide is all about. It's all about leaky gut. So if your patient comes in and the medical history is intestinal symptoms, diarrhea, bloating, abdominal pain, other types of intestinal symptoms as well. Plus they have 10 or more foods that are like three or four plus on the FIT test. So a lot of foods. And then candida is three or four plus and zonulin is three or four plus. So what this indicates is that this person has leaky gut. And as a result of that, they have the symptoms. What they also have is a lot of food antigens are getting through the gut wall because the gut wall is now permeable because zonulin has opened up those tight junction and form pores. And then what happens along with the food getting through and the zonulin opening those tight junction is candida is normal flora. It's on the skin and mucous membranes. It's a normal, normal flora of the human body. But what happens is if it overgrows in the gut and you have any sort of leaky gut, these, an, these uh, organisms grow and die, grow and die. And when they die, they release antigens. And these antigens now get through the tight junctions that have been opened. They get into the lamina propria and you start to generate an antibody. So the, like the candida I look at is like the canary in the coal mine. So if you've got, if you've got a lot of foods, you've got candida and the intestinal symptoms and zonulin, then pretty much you know this person has leaky gut. And then what you might want to think about is, does this person uh, or would this person benefit from a gut healing protocol? You know, whether it's glutamine or, or a probiotic or, or some other component that you could add to their diet that would help uh, promote uh, gut health and also reduce leaky gut. So that would be the goal here. If you can reduce leaky gut, you reduce the exposure of the, of the uh, antigen, uh, the antigen uh, getting through and producing antibody. And as a result, you don't form immune complexes, you don't activate complement, you don't have inflammation, and the patient should feel better. So that's how this all ties in together. And, and why I stress to know the medical history that's very important because the symptoms will sometimes guide you to where you will be. And the FIT test will just be supportive evidence that says, yep, I suspected that it was leaky gut because of the symptoms. Now the FIT test kind of confirms that. So now that's more evidence uh, on which we can uh, base um, a patient treatment. And the next slide. 
So here are the real conclusions. So the FIT test, so multi-pathway detection. So we measure IgG, so the acquired immune system and complement C3D, the innate immune system. Other tests only measure the acquired immune system, IgG, get only one signal. The FIT test gets two signals. The FIT test measures acquired IgG and innate C3D immune system, as I just said. Very, very important. The anti-zonulin antibody is a marker of gut permeability. So first, zonulin protein opens the pore, then zonulin as a protein also gets through that pore, and when it does, the dendritic cells say, wait a minute, zonulin needs to be mopped up, let me process that, we'll present it to the T and B cells, and we'll start producing an antibody. That's where KDMO comes in. We said, that's a better way to measure zonulin indirectly than try to measure a marker that can appear or disappear or is uh, subject to huge cross-reactivity. So the unique recombinant zonulin eliminates this cross-reactivity, which is extraordinarily important. KBMO is the only company to have this protein. There is no other company that has it, and we're not gonna make it available to any other company. Uh, leaky gut, so that's intestinal symptoms, many positive foods, zonulin positive and candida, three and four positives. So just think about of, of, uh, putting that together. And someone would asked me today, as a matter of fact, the patient had a lot of symptoms. They were positive for zonulin was three plus. They had 12 positive foods. What would I do? I say, well, in that case, I, I say candida was negative. And remember, these antibody measurements are just a snapshot in time. So I would say most likely that person would have some element of leaky gut based on the symptomology and two out of the three. So use your judgment when you're looking at the test results. It's not hard and fast that they have to have all four or it's not leaky gut. I would say more look at it and kind of be a little bit flexible. And then I would mainly listen to um, what the symptomology was. On that note, thank you very much. Well, doctor, thank you uh, for this part. Now we're going to take some questions. Uh, we're going to go back over the questions that were submitted. Um, so the first question, can you tell me what distinguishes the KBMO FIT test from LEAP MRT 170 food sensitivity test? Yeah, um, that particular test measures, you know, shrinking and swelling of cells. So extracellular volume is what they look at. And what they do is they expose the white blood cells, so the lymphocytes, to various types of food antigens. And then they look at the extracellular volume and um, you know, shrinking or swelling of cells. And what they say is if they shrink or swell or the extracellular volume increases, that's an indication of a food sensitivity. Well, what we know about lymphocytes is that they, they secrete both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory peptides. So just because a cell shrinks or swells doesn't mean that you're generating inflammation or food sensitivities. Um, so what I encourage uh, people to look at is the fact that the FIT test measures analytes, things that can be measured. A test, a cellular test like that measures a phenomenon. It tells you that the extracellular volumes increased or a cell is shrunk or swollen and vita infra. You're supposed to believe that an inflammatory cytokine has been, re olympokine has been, re uh, been released and that's never been shown. So there's no link between what that cell's doing and what that cell is releasing because we know it can do either pro or anti-inflammatory. So what I would say is when they show me that those cells are releasing and, and, and uh, inflammatory components, then they're measuring an, antelite, an analyte and I'm a believer. Now, the other thing is I, I um, used to do a lot of these tests when I was at MIT with viruses and they are extraordinarily hard to control and you get one shot, you don't have a repeat because you'll use that cell, up, use that sample up and then you have to take another sample. Whereas the FIT test, we have retains of both blood spot and serum, and we can repeat it 
in case we have a questionable result. So these te those sorts of tests, those cellular tests are very, very, uh, they're, they're on the difficult end of the spectrum to run. They have to be extraordinarily carefully controlled and um, you do never get a second chance on them, never. Okay. Um, a, a bunch of uh, of our viewers are asking where the practitioner guide is, and I can tell you this: on Avexi Diagnostics, once you log into your account, under the Tools menu at the top, if you click on that, you'll see the Client Resources, and then click on that, go to the Client Resources homepage. Along the left side, you'll see the uh, Fit Test section. And in there is the practitioner's guide. And as the doctor was saying, he's working on a, a new version. And the minute he releases that, we'll get it in there. So that's uh, that's related to that. We have um, another question. Do you need to eat the food immediately before you take the test to show accurate results? What if you don't eat it or haven't in years? For example, if I'm gluten-free, can I still test to wheat? and it's its components. Okay. Uh, in general, you're going to test positive to the foods that you eat, okay, or eat in very recently before taking the test. So we um, uh, ask practitioners and patients to eat a normal diet prior to taking the sample because you're going to test positive to the things you eat. Now, having said that, there are a couple of exceptions to that. Some people are respond for very long times. So you can maybe not have a food for three or six months and some individuals will still test positive. Um, now, that shouldn't be, right? If the half-life is three to four weeks, that antibody should go away in three or four or five months. In some individuals, it doesn't. And in some cases in the literature, when you look at different types of antibodies, people have been positive for up to 10 years. And, and that's because they don't, no one knows exactly, but they, there's about 40 or 45 immune response genes in the background uh, that, that overlay um, control on um, B cells and T cell activation. And these lymphokines and cytokines um, can either upregulate or downregulate antibody response. So what people have thought would be some people are very high responders, and there's a genetic component associated with that. And then you have other people that are low responders and they're genetically predisposed towards that. So I would say, you know, it falls into both camp, but as a general rule, have the patient or client eat the food, eat a normal diet, take the, take the sample, and then let the test guide which foods are removed in the elimination phase. Okay. And then a uh, question, how can we learn more about cross reactivities like fennel ring? Um, again, uh, in the literature, there's a lot of information uh, on allergies and fennel groups and, and those sorts of things. So um, again, what the provider's guide will do is it gives you a base amount of information and some references and the expanded guide, which should just be out even more so. And then what you can do is you can build on that. Um, what I didn't want to do is get so far down in the weeds with some of these explanations where, you know, people say, oh my God, I just want to know, you know, I just want to know what happens. I don't have to know every detail. So what the guide will do is will, it will lead you to an understanding at a good level and then give you a basis to, to look at the literature. Okay. Another Quick question. Um, I tested positive for coffee, but I never drink coffee. What could the result be from? Um, well, I'd have to look at the overall test that you took. And, and as I mentioned, there could be things that you're consuming that would cross react with coffee, and that could be wheat. So if you, if you have a wheat sensitivity of some sort, or wheat, if you're positive to wheat, you've got cross reactive peptides. Um, that occur in coffee. Now, a lot of times you can trace it to one or more foods. Um, and, and again, it, the, the, the goal here is to try to figure out whether it's a true reactivity or cross reactivity. And most of the time you're gonna be able to do it. You look at supplements, for instance, what's in there. 
but sometimes you you just can't. If, if you if you score positive, let's say at a one plus, I say that's a borderline reaction, and it's right right on the right on the cusp of the 90 95 percent. But if it's a three or a four plus, that's in the like the 99 percentile. So there's a 99 or 99.9% chance that that's a true positive. So we know it's coming from something. The challenge is to try to find in a diet or supplement or medication exactly where that's coming from. And coffee and, and, and wheat, to make a long story short, uh, is, is a well-known phenomenon. Okay, a uh, question, is there a correlation between stool zonulin and zonulin seen in the serum? Uh, I don't know what the exact correlation is. Um, I know what happens is that some of it's secreted into the lumen and, and excreted in feces, and some of it gets through and into the bloodstream. And uh, be, I'm going to be truthful. I don't know what the exact what the exact correlation is. I, I I don't. I can find out, but I don't know the exact correlation. Okay. Okay. Uh, quick more question: Is it very concerning to have multiple? Uh, red food, you know, four plus foods identified, say over 20 foods, would it mean higher permeability? Uh, does it occur often? Where would you start to eliminate all the foods in the higher range? Um, mm -hmm. Right. Something like that. I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen 20 in the red, but from time to time, you'll see 20. And um, yes, that would be, in, that would indicate to me you have uh, increase in gut permeability. And generally, one of those would be candida. And if we tested zonulin, uh, chances are zonulin would be high as well. Okay. Uh, someone wrote, I understand the fit tests for type 2 and type 3, but what about type 4 cell activation? No, it doesn't test for those. That's a, that's a different um, uh, type of uh, pathway uh, uh, totally. That's where immune complexes um, uh, mostly uh, deposit in the dermis, and what happens is those immune complexes then activate, complement, and generate typical type of arthritis type reactions. We do not test for those. That's a cellular reaction. Okay, great. Um, someone wrote, had a test come back with polysorbate 80 at 4 plus, do you have resources to help guide locating sources for this? Yeah, again, that, that's a very good question, and we focus on that in the provider's guide. And polysorbate 80 is one of those things you say, okay, it's, it's, it's tween 80, it's a detergent, it's an emulsifier, it is in everything. I mean, hot dogs, puddings, sausages, um, all kinds, soups, everything. I mean, where they want a good creamy consistency and an emulsion to form, they put this stuff in there. And it, it's just in everything and i was really surprised frankly a long time ago when i looked this thing up to just find out how frequently this is used in food processing but it goes over a lot of that in the guide but um yeah it's it's one of those things that you don't think about much but it's very very pervasive in processed foods okay uh another question there seem to be a ton of test options related to the FIT test. How do you determine if you want to test for IgG and IgA or just IgG, dried blood, serum, et cetera? Well, yeah, that's a good, good question. So what I would say is food sensitivities are caused by IgG and immune complexes. So that would be a natural go-to. IgA forms immune complexes, but it doesn't activate complement. So you don't get the complement piece. Excuse me. So nope. what, what, I, what I would say, so you don't get the complement piece. And then in terms of sample, it's just preference. The serum and blood spot, we test them head to head. We've done extensive work with these things. They're equivalent. So if someone likes a blood draw and it's convenient, you do that. We've got a phlebotomist that we can send out or we can get in various parts of the country. Or if you wanna do a finger stick, and that's simpler for you. So those two samples, they're equivalent in terms of sensitivity and specificity. It's just a question of, of preference. Okay. And lastly, just uh, another comment from 
the comment about the coffee. I was four plus for coffee, but nothing for wheat. So that was that mm -hmm. earlier question about the coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Then that's that's something I just again offhand I can't tell you where exactly that's coming from. But um, if I had the test results, um, I knew medical history, I knew supplements and medications. I could start to kind of flesh that out. So that that's a bit of a uh, quandary right now. I don't know, um, but we'd have to take a look at that and see if there's something in the diet that may be um, uh, kicking off that antibody. But what I can tell you is at a four plus, that's like in the 99.9% .9 chance that that's a true positive. So you got like 0.01% chance that that's a false positive. So that tells me something is producing that antibody and it, and as yet it's just undetermined okay well thank you for everyone for all those great questions and all those great answers doctor okay so now we're gonna move um on to a little bit of uh housekeeping here i want to mention the uh ask the doctor service uh Dr. Wayne Sedano is, is actually on the webinar. Um, he's available for free service where um, you're, you can sub, uh, submit questions to Dr. Sedano and he'll review the test results, clinical conditions, further test recommendations, or answers to any other questions you may have via email. Uh, you're also, there is a another option for a phone or video conference for an additional fee. Um, and then, Right now, we ha are, are welcome this offer for a KVMO fit test for the first time uh, purchasers. Um, we have fit 132, normally priced at 275, discounted to 175, and fit 176 uh, at the regular price of 375 down to 275. Um, again, this promotional offer is only available for first time users. Uh, the discount is only valid on the first test performed, and an account credit of $100 will be applied at the end of the month when your first FIT test is completed. Okay, so take advantage of that. Um, now I would like to go over how to order the test. Uh, when you log into your account, your Vexia account, uh, first you will need to uh, go to the Avexia link ordering section, which is located in the left-hand column of the dashboard. There's a quick link. Uh, next, you must select or create a patient to assign the test to. Um, through the special click so, uh, specialty labs and then go to the KBMO products tab. Locate the fit test option or cho of your choice and then complete the order by clicking the place order button. It's, it's very simple. And now, um, if you have any questions or issues, you may contact us um, at info at avexiadiagnostics.com by email or by phone five days a week through extended hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern at 888-852-2723. Thank you, Dr. Dorval and Dr. Sedano for this informative presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available by email in the next few days. Thank you all for joining us for this webinar event. Until next time, from everyone at Avexia Diagnostics and KBMO, stay healthy, stay safe, and we wish you all the best on your pathway to wellness. Thank you, Great. and good Thank evening. You. Thank you. Thank you.